Tis almost the season, so grab the figgy pudding, mull some wine, and load up Disney+. Plus. Because it's been a year, so we're talking about Hawkeye. In my opinion, a pretty darn solid show held back from greatness by a few scattered issues, and one major one. Ho ho ho. It's probably worth noting here that, as with my previous videos in this format, this isn't going to be like a blow-by-blow blow of the whole six episodes. I'm just going to focus in on what I think are the most interesting aspects of Hawkeye, the things that stood out to me on rewatch, and where it stands one year on. So without any further ado, let's begin. Hawkeye is kind of hard to summarize succinctly, and we'll touch on the reason for that later, but in the smallest, neatest nutshell possible, it follows experienced secret agent and superhero Clint Barton, aka Hawkeye, and wannabe sidekick Kate Bishop, as they try and solve a murder, regain some stolen items, and get out of New York City alive before Christmas. This is all brought to life by some really strong performances, particularly from our leads, Jeremy Renner and Haley Steinfeld. Renner's Hawkeye this time around is older, weary, vulnerable. By this point, it's clear that this take on the character is distinct from the hothead of the comics, but here we finally get a chance to lean into those differences. Renner initially gives us a repentant family man, struggling to move past the darkness that overtook him during the blip. Bronin was vicious, unrelenting, near superhuman in his grief-driven frenzy because he had nothing to lose. Clint does. That makes him more reluctant, more cautious, and weaker. Renner lets us see just how much pain this hero's in, emotionally, but also physically. It's hard to say if this, the humanity of Hawkeye, is better realized here than previously, or if that's just down to the increased screen time, but either way, it makes for a good watch, and helps to distinguish this character, this show, from the rest of this now crowded genre. And the depth here makes his journey to the costumed, trick arrow shooting superhero we see at the show's end, who embraces both his limitations and the symbolic power striving to overcome those limitations generates, really satisfying. Steinfeld's great as Kate here, too. Marvel's introduced a whole bunch of new characters in Phase 4, and I'm racking my brains to think of one I like as much as Kate, but I got nothing. That's partly thanks to the writing here, of course, but the performance is great, too. You can tell Steinfeld isn't just here for the paycheck, that she's having fun with the role, and that fun carries over to the viewer. There is one issue I have with Kate here, that's the way this story tries to pass off her wealth and privilege as, like, a character flaw, and then never resolves this properly, so that's weird. I've actually talked about this before, way back like a year ago in more depth, so go check that video out if you want a better picture of what I mean here. Other than this though, Kate's a great addition to this world, and Steinfeld shines. A lot of the minor characters are really solid too. Swordsman is a lot of fun. I'm a big fan of the way the whole red herring, mysterious mastermind angle falls away toward the end, and we realize Jack's just a big doofus being manipulated alongside everyone else. Tony Dalton's performance is great because you can watch any one of his scenes from the first four episodes or so, and see both of these angles simultaneously, the Machiavelli and the goofball. Florence Pugh's Yelena Belova so consistently steals scenes you'd think she was playing Black Cat, and there's a real sense that she's matured since the events of Black Widow. Just not too much. Elena is the perfect blend of mother and villain. Grills just seems like a cool guy, and the best side character of all is, of course, Lucky. Hey. Hey. <laughs> I'll admit Echo didn't fully click with me, but that's probably as much to do with the way her story's sort of peripheral here as it is anything else. More on that later. The effects are all pretty good, and I think the choreography works well too. It's probably not like the best fight choreography the franchise has ever seen, that'd probably go to Shang-Chi or Winter Soldier still, but aside from a couple of weaker moments, it's fun, it's tactile, and it diverges from Marvel's house style now and then in order to really accommodate the archery and ranged-based action unique to these characters. Long-range combat hasn't looked this satisfying since the last time I solo orped a Psy on Ancient. Outside of choreography, there's also stuff to like about Hawkeye's general visual style. There's a richness of colour here. There's a few interesting long takes. Stuff like this is hardly praiseworthy, but it does mean that a lot of those complaints about that generic Marvel visual style don't really apply here. You could even argue that these long takes show Hawkeye gesturing toward the cinematic language of realism, fitting for a street-level, non-superpowered story like this. I also think the tone deserves praise. It's an action-adventure show, sure, but that sort of die-hard light vibe isn't all this show's got going for it. It's also sweet. 
and it's sincere with its sweetness in a way that a lot of these projects are often afraid to be. That MCU humour is here to a degree, but it's not ever present. It knows when it isn't needed. The show's also dripping with holiday spirit, in a way I really enjoy. It can sometimes feel a bit gaudy, a bit tacky, to drape a film or show in the trappings of Christmas this much, to stuff its soundtrack so full of stone cold Christmas bangers, but for a show like Hawkeye, a show for which family and togetherness are utterly central, relentlessly festive is a flavour I'm very down for. I also think this show did a great job of writing an introductory story for Kate specific to this setting, this cinematic universe. I'm not talking talking about the way that other elements of this universe pop up in the show here. That does happen, and this interconnectivity is generally handled well. It's not very often obtrusive. No, I'm talking about the way Kate's backstory and motivation are rejigged to be a consequence of those familiar narratives we the audience have been following throughout this franchise. See, the first episode opens in 2012, with some Bishop family flashback drama, which we experience through young Kate's perspective, until it's interrupted by, well, aliens attacking. It becomes clear this is all happening during the events of Avengers 1. Kate's alone, terrified, but then she sees Clint, and this, well, I'll let Kate explain herself. When I was younger, aliens invaded, and I was alone. And I was terrified, but then I saw you. Fighting aliens with a stick and a string. And I thought, if he could do that, then I didn't have to be scared. That's neat. We really don't often get to see the way regular people perceive the heroes of the MCU. And using Clint's role in the Battle of New York as the foundation for MCU Kate's characterization sets up a really rich dynamic for the later episodes to play with. What's more, this move has us empathizing with Kate right from the get-go. We know how this kid feels. We know that sense of awe she's experiencing here. Because we all felt it too, 10 years ago, when Avengers 1 came out. Some of us were even kids then, too. I think this confluence of perspective, the way the opening has the viewer's place merge with the characters, finds Hawkeye really fulfilling the potential of the MCU, of this shared universe, and in a less showy, more substantial way than a lot of those bigger crossovers. There's also the interesting way this opening contributes to the show's interest in perspective and image more widely, and in case any of you missed it, I put out a video not long ago looking at the way these themes operate in Hawkeye, so I won't repeat myself here, but yeah, it's cool. Another thematic centre of the show that I think gets handled well is the idea of legacy. Fitting, I guess, for a series introducing a legacy character, and we've seen that before in Black Widow, in The Falcon and the Winter Soldier, and now again in Miss Marvel or Love and Thunder, but none of those dwelled on the idea of legacy, of continuation, of expectations, any of the things that make one character taking up the mantle of another interesting. This show's at its most cerebral when it's taking those aforementioned ideas of image and knowing, looking at the fact that this franchise is 15 years old, and asking what persists after a hero's retirement, after death. And the centre of all this is a character we never actually see, Natasha Romanoff, the original Black Widow who of course perished in Endgame. She's so important here that one secondary function of the Hawkeye show is a remembrance of Natasha, a commemoration honestly more significant, more touching than anything we saw in Endgame or Black Widow. Natasha. I really need to talk to you right now. It isn't all doom and gloom though. One of my favourite little things about this show is the way we see this new Hawkeye and this new Black Widow forming a bond reminiscent of the one shared by their predecessors. Alright. Hmm. Best shot you ever took? Uh, the one I didn't take. Given Natasha's death, given the heavy, wintry weight it places at times on this show, it's really sweet to see this. It feels like renewal, like seeing the first bulbs of spring appearing on a previously barren tree. These two bounce off each other really well. Most characters in the show play together well. The character interactions and dynamics in Hawkeye are probably the best part of it, but the scenes shared by these two in particular are often episode highlights. There's so much chemistry here, and I hope we see a lot more of it in the future. That being said, said, and I'm not totally sure how to approach this, so please forgive my bluntness, but 
was this queer baiting. See, I remember when this first came out. I remember seeing these sparks fly and wondering if there was supposed to be something here beyond a mere platonic compatibility. I don't know, I thought they were vibing. But I wasn't sure if I was just seeing things or if I was unintentionally superimposing some fetishistic media stereotyping of all mutual female affection as romantic or sexual upon this show. Now, one year on, it's clear I was far from the only one to have read their dynamic in this way. So if scenes like this are laden with queer subtext, what's the issue? Who's to say Marvel won't follow up on this? Well, here's the thing, comic book Yelena is an asexual aromantic, or at least this is heavily implied to be the case. And look, I'm not claiming that anyone shipping these two as being unintentionally aphobic or anything, but canonically speaking, what are the options here? Either these two do get something going, in which case I don't want to call that erasure per se, but at the very least it feels like a huge potentially disrespectful missed opportunity to actually depict some chronically underrepresented facets of human identity, or nothing comes of this chemistry. And either it's never followed up, in which case yeah, potentially queer baiting, or we find out that this Yelena 2 is ace. Would that even be queer baiting technically if one queer relationship were teased, but we instead got another expression of queer identity? I'm not sure, but regardless of taxonomy, it's still suggesting an on-screen treatment of queer love and not following through. That's probably still not great. Look, I'm not condemning anything here. I'm not trying to cancel Hawkeye. What I am saying is that it looks like the show's created a complicated issue here, one that I struggle to see Marvel resolving cleanly, and that we ought to bear it in mind going forward. That isn't even the major issue I mentioned in the introduction, my biggest problem with the show. The one that holds it back from being truly it is probably about time we got to that though. So here it is. There's too much plot here. Let's take stock. What have we got going on in these six episodes? Well, we've got the main two. Kate's investigation into her family's dodgy dealings, the murder, the crimes, and Clint's quest to put the Barton family ghosts back to bed and get home before Christmas. There's also the whole Echo backdoor pilot, the storyline around Maya leading the tracksuits, trying to track down Ronin to avenge her dad, then finding out Kazi and Kingpin were also to blame, and getting her revenge on them. Add to this Yelena's quest to avenge her sister, her eventual reconciliation with Clint, and that aforementioned lingering remembrance of Natasha Romanoff, and you've got yourself a pretty stuffed show. There's a lot of overlap here, obviously, but I think it's fair to say that those four areas of Hawkeye's narrative can be thought of as major, largely distinct strands. And that's before we get to the, I guess, subplots. Stuff like the LARPer's journey from park cosplayers to undercover assets, or the slow-burning build-up to the secret big bad. Here's my take. This is too much, at least for a six-episode series. Maybe across nine, eight, even seven episodes, this could have come together properly, but as it stands, Hawkeye's just that little bit overstuffed. It's taking a lot of shots, and it's hitting a lot of targets, but because of this, none of them are quite bullseyes. And this becomes very apparent in the last two or three episodes, and particularly the finale. Pacing speeds up. Beats don't get to breathe in the way they used to. Things start making less sense, or at least fewer explanations are given. We swing back and forth between parallel stories, which begin to feel less and less connected. It isn't bad, and I wouldn't even call it messy per se, but it does start to feel a bit unfocused. And if you've seen this show, I'm guessing you know what I mean by this. Kingpin's a good example. He's only introduced at the end of episode 5, in a snippet we see in full at the finale's opening. After this, we only see him toward the episode's end, attacking Eleanor. We get a brief, confusing fight between him and Kate. How strong is he? Is he invulnerable? Why isn't he trying to kill her? And then he limps off to set up the Echo solo show. What a surprise. There's been a lot of criticism around his role in this show, more on that later, and one common refrain is that he shouldn't have been a big reveal. He should have had a place in the show all along. The thing is though, there's barely room for him in the show as is. With more episodes, or with less crowded episodes, I'm sure Wilson Fisk would have been built up better. We'd have a better sense of who he is now, what his aims are, and why he does what he does, but there just isn't space for that amidst the clutter. I think the reason I didn't fully get into Maya's story is similar. She's only really a presence in the story from episode 3 onward, and the last point at which her story overlaps meaningfully with Clint or Kate is in episode 5. After that, she's finishing up her side of things more or less independently. 
life, but we really haven't been given much reason to care about her journey in the preceding episodes. We get a small handful of childhood scenes, a perfunctory, standard issue orphaning, and that's that. The most involving aspect of Maya's role in this show as it stands is the harsh light she shines on Clint and his dark Ronin legacy, and so she makes a compelling foil for our twin heroes around the show's midpoint, but her more independent role in the finale, all but severed from our protagonists, isn't nearly as compelling, because her role in the preceding episodes hasn't been big enough, developed enough to redeem her criminality, or to set her up as a third protagonist. There are more examples you could give, like I don't know, the LARPers. Structurally, they fulfil a broadly similar role here to that of the building's residents in the Matt Fraction comic run this show is very loosely adapting, but again there isn't enough spotlight to go around. So whereas their comic book equivalents became a sort of community, a representation of what Clint did all this for, the LARPers are at most a fun oddity on the peripheries of this story. Again, I could keep going, but I think I've made my point. The sad part is, there was an alternative here, a pretty obvious one. Hawkeye could have cut one of these plot lines. The most obvious chopping block candidates, the ones that had best preserve the general shape of the series we got, are of course the Echo slash Kingpin story, or the Black Widows one. But to be honest, I think this show, the Hawkeye show, could have worked with any three of these four plot lines. Cut out Yelena, and the whole story revolves around the investigation of the Bishop mystery, while our heroes try to avoid the Ronin hunting TSM. Tracksuit Mafia, that is, not Team Solo Mid. Soon enough, our heroes discover that both of these, the carrot and the stick so to speak, are two prongs of the same narrative fork, that they're umbilically linked through Eleanor and her shadowy boss. In this version of Hawkeye, the focus narrows from legacy and perception more widely to the tarnishing and recovery of legacy how we uncover the sins of the past, and how we atone for them, or fail to. Redemption and damnation. In this version, we'd get more Fisk sooner. In this version, there's room for Maya to be developed, for the show to involve us in her story. Or cut out the Echo slash Kingpin story and you're left with Kate looking into her family stuff and Clint seeking down the suit and the watch, which in this draft of the story are probably mixed up with Yelena, as a gambit by the latter to draw Clint out into the open. The overlap here would be that both Yelena and Eleanor are working with a shadowy backer, still Kingpin, but we wouldn't ever actually see him, until perhaps a post credit stinger for a Fisk-oriented second season, but that's optional. A cleaner way to trim down this side of the story might even be to nix Kingpin or Echo, but not both. Keep the show largely as is, but either have Kazi and Maya acting more or less independently of the TSM's rotund backer, or sub them out entirely for good old Mr. When I was a boy over here. If you wanted to get more radical, cut Kate entirely. I can't imagine I'd have enjoyed a Kate-less version of Hawkeye nearly as much, but a laser focus on Clint as he atones for all that Ronin-ing, as he comes up against Echo, Yelena, and Kingpin, and maybe even the Red Herring of Sloan Limited and Jack Decane, that's still plenty of material for a well-balanced six-part series. It'd be less concerned with legacy and image, more a character study, a deeper dive into what Clint's type of brittle humanity means in this world of Black Widows and hulked-out crime bosses, how he overcomes it to become superhuman. The show could even work on a basic level without Clint. That is more feasible than it sounds. One way to do this would be to introduce the idea that after Endgame, after the mass battle where the tons of people involved saw Clint in the Ronin suit, word got out to villains particularly in the know, like Kingpin. Say Clint reached a fragile understanding with him though, an understanding that if anyone came for his family, Ronin would be back with a vengeance. This is all off screen before the show starts, we'd learn about it from Echo or Fisk as the show wears on, so no Clint, but the first episode plays out the same way from Kate's perspective, with one change. They don't see it isn't Clint in the suit, at least not yet. So the TSM, Kingpin, all Clint's old enemies start to tear the city apart looking for Kate, not realising she's not Clint. Even Yelena comes a-looking on that same contract, and the show plays out from there, Kate trying to get to the bottom of her own family shenanigans while fighting off the enemies of her idols, including foe-turned-ally Yelena, until she realises that both sides of this are more connected than she had thought. This had reached the real Clint eventually, so maybe he turns up in the last episode or two to help clear things up. 
And this, more so than any of the above, would be a fairly different show, with its own flaws, probably many of them. It probably wouldn't be better than the version we got, it'd probably be way worse, but it's worth considering as a thought experiment, because I think the fact that you could cut Hawkeye from Hawkeye and still have a recognisable story illustrates just how much there is going on here, how many points the narrative is orbiting. To be crystal clear, I'm not criticising the existing show because it didn't do any of these things. I'm criticising it because it's overstuffed, and I've thrown out these trimmed down pictures as evidence of this. Obviously in any of the above scenarios you'd have to do a lot of rejigging beyond the details I mentioned, but I think all of them work conceptually, and all of them are a lot more focused than the show we got. And just to reiterate, the version of the show we got works too. It's a bit too busy, the pacing falls apart a bit, but it is fun. And as we explored in that last Hawkeye video, it's able to use all of these elements together in interesting ways. To me though, the show we got is flawed. There's a problem that holds it back from greatness, from exemplifying the potential of this then newish medium in the way that Loki did, for instance. And this overstuffedness is that problem. Does it kill the rest of this? Not at all. I still really like this project, but it does kind of sting to know that greatness was this close. But hey, I get called a shill when I'm too positive about the MCU, so let's balance that mild praise out with some minor miscellaneous gripes, because I know the internet loves that. There are points when this take on Hawkeye feels kind of incongruous with what we'd seen before in the MCU. I'm thinking primarily of his arsenal of trick arrows, which barring like a USB arrow, some explosive arrows, stuff like that, we'd seen in none of his other appearances. And the show never treats it like it's some new tech he'd recently got his hands on. If anything, it's the opposite. It seems like we're seeing a world-weary secret operative forced to crack open his old box of tricks one last time, and that's a fun way to frame it, but it is probably one which would have worked better had we seen goop arrows, or growth arrows, or acid arrows, or any of these other really nifty little things at any point in the last decade of Hawkeye appearances. But we really didn't see much of this at all. It wouldn't have been hard to add some sense of progression to Hawkeye's style and arsenal across his previous appearances in the franchise. It could have been a similar thing to the way Iron Man suits got more and more advanced, but throw away line at the start of Age of Ultron about Stark upgrading Clint's old shield quiver, a couple of shots of him shooting acid arrows or EMP arrows throughout the film, Civil War could have seen him raid a prototype tech cupboard in the compound as he freed Wanda, and had him show up to the airport with flashbang arrows or bowler arrows. Could even have sent Clint over to Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. for a few episodes to help the team out with some op back before Marvel Studios decided Coulson and co had the cheese touch, and Fitz and Simmons could have hooked him up with some flashy new gear. But given that none of this happened, the way this show folds in trick arrows does just feel a little off. I think the blame for this admittedly minor issue is best laid at the feet of the MCU's previous efforts rather than with this show's writers, because I really can't blame the Hawkeye team one bit for seizing this opportunity, potentially the last opportunity to go nuts with Clint Barton. It's sort of fitting, given Phase 4's more comic booky MO, that the dour super spy Clint we started out with is now skiing around a big Christmas tree, turning goons into owl chow, and I'm definitely glad that this is where they've taken Hawkeye, but somewhere along the way, a bit more of a transition may have helped this feel a bit more natural. That is a bit nitpicky, and it really doesn't bother me much at all, but it is something which kept popping up in the back of my mind as I rewatched these episodes, so hey, now you get to hear about it too. This is also a shining example of the elongated movie problem a lot of people have with Marvel's Disney Plus shows. These six episodes are totally serialised and do often feel more like one continuous blob sliced up fairly arbitrarily into sixths than they do, you know, television episodes. This is something you could say about a lot of these projects, but arguably not to this extent. With something like Moon Knight or Loki, it's all one ongoing narrative, but each episode has something of a unique identity. For instance, with Moon Knight, the Cairo episode fed into the Tomb Raider episode, which fed into the Duat episode. In Loki, the Sleuthing episode went into the Lamentus episode, then we had the TVA escape episode, the void episode, and the finale at the Citadel. Maybe this is slightly cope, but to a point, these projects managed to differentiate their chapters aesthetically and tonally, if not narratively. Hawkeye though, it blends together a little more. 
She-Hulk wasn't like this, not really, and the increased episode orders for Daredevil Born Again and that Agatha show might indicate Marvel's trying to get their TV to start feeling more like, you know, TV in the future. Maybe the projects which would have been turned into these six-part event shows will go on to become the Marvel special presentations of tomorrow. Who's to say? We don't know. We can't know. And this speculative future will only really become relevant to the Hawkeye show if it ever gets a second season. In terms of how this non-TV-like approach to TV affects season one, though, I think there's both good and bad here. The idea of movie, but with more room to breathe, I think, is fine. Indeed, some of the best bits of Hawkeye come when the characters get a chance to step away from the narrative. Take Kate and Clint's moment on the subway in episode three. Oh, we gotta walk the dog. You're not wrong. He's been cooped up all day. Dude, I'm just walk sure the dog. What do you think? Been cooped up all day. Here, we get to see the two archers just, like, getting along. We get to see something we hadn't really seen up until this point. Kate and Clint are pretty similar, actually. They're on the same wavelength. Up until this point, there'd always been a sort of power dynamic between the two which had hidden this, but all that falls away, alongside the nerves and adrenaline of the previous chase sequence, and we just get to see our two protagonists bond and breathe. There's plenty of other moments which I think fall into this category, little snatches of heart in the spaces between the story. Take the bit where the two archers are just larking about, having a bit of a Christmas do, and hitting trick shots around the apartments. Or take that brilliantly bittersweet scene where Kate helps the hearing aid Clint take a phone call from his kid. Time to text. Can you text? Can you text me? What? It might be a little uh, delay, but it's kind of a bad connection. I miss you so much. Um, I'm gonna be there, buddy. Hey, you know I'm gonna be there, like I said, right? Honestly, you can keep your kingpin and your trick arrows. This scene clears all that for me. It's just a really poignant way of having Kate learn why for Clint this whole situation isn't the exciting romp it is for her. It's wrecked his plans, and it's torn him away from his family, the one thing that brought him back from the precipice. She experiences this, and we do too. To be honest, there's plenty more moments like this, and I guess even if this had been done as a movie instead, any one of these scenes may well have made the cut, but I really doubt all of them would have done. The flip side, of course, is that this extended runtime is probably partially to blame for the overstuffedness of Hawkeye we talked about earlier. I don't think such a crowded, multipolar narrative was always going to emerge once the Hawkeye TV project had been given the go-ahead, but I do think there's some parallel timeline to ours where this was a movie or a special presentation, and in that timeline, the writers probably did nix one of these storylines. And I think it's possible that even in our timeline, some Hawkeye movie spec script or draft may well have been used for the basis of the show we ended up getting, and one of these storylines, probably either of the Echo or Yelena ones, was written in to pump it up from film length to series length. Honestly though, that's some pretty heavy speculation on my part, so it's probably not worth thinking about any longer. Suffice it to say that this probably could have been a movie instead. That might have been a better route in some respects, but that also would have meant losing a fair deal of what made Hawkeye Hawkeye, and what made Hawkeye good. And at the end of the day, we got what we got. Maybe formally it was a bit of a mixed bag, but since none of us have time machines and keycards to the Marvel Studios headquarters, we'll just have to appreciate the good parts of that mixed bag and accept the rest. Of course, typically that sort of approach isn't what the internet's best at, especially not the corner of it which likes talking about superhero media. One year on, you don't really tend to see people fondly reminiscing about Hawkeye, about this enjoyable yet flawed holiday romp. You don't see a lot of people discussing the character dynamics, the slow, satisfying way the show builds Clint and Kate from strangers to partners and friends. You don't see much talk about the way Hawkeye also serves as a more heartfelt eulogy for Natasha than either Endgame or Black Widow. No, to be honest, you really don't see people talking about Hawkeye at all. And on the rare occasion someone does bring it up, nine times out of ten, it's just kingpin bad. Which, yeah, I can totally see why people might not love Fisk's appearance here, but not to the point that the other 2 hours 55 minutes of this 3 hour series should get totally memory hold. 
Case in point, the first time I really brought up the fact that I was working on this video in my Discord server, the first real response I got was someone asking how I felt about the utilization of Kingpin. That isn't why I'm writing this section, by the way. I wrote the above paragraph before any of that Discord stuff happened. It just goes to show, though, I'm not making this up. People don't talk so much about the overstuffedness, of which this Kingpin's failings are a symptom, it's just Kingpin. But why? Why is this, and this alone, the part of Hawkeye that seems to have made the biggest mark? That's, that's a rhetorical question, by the way. I think I've got an answer. Kingpin's from the Netflix Daredevil show. He's a beloved character from something outside of Hawkeye, and this is his first introduction to the Marvel Studios side of this world. His feature here is probably the closest Hawkeye came to furthering the overarching structure of the MCU. Or at the very least, his role here is the part of the show which the online section of its viewership had invested the most hype into. Without Kingpin, the stakes here are a lot lower. If you focus on the rest of the story, rather than on the in and out of universe implications of Fisk's involvement, this is more or less the street-level MCU adventure people have been asking for since forever. And yet, internet discourse seems inordinately fixated on the one segment of this show that isn't like this, that connects to the larger franchise. That's a little odd, isn't it? Maybe fans don't know what they want. Maybe there's a bigger divide than I'm granting between what fans want, what they enjoy, and what they discuss. I don't know. But I will say that I think there's got to be a link between the peculiar way this show seems to have faded away from the online consciousness, and the low stakes, relative of course to the world ending threats common to these projects. And if that is the case, that probably doesn't bode brilliantly for the future of street-level Marvel. But I'm going to draw things to a close here, because holy god, this has been a long video. In conclusion, then, Hawkeye isn't perfect. It's got a litany of flaws, some major, some minor. But in spite of all these, I really had a good time revisiting it. A better time than I expected to, and I liked this show when it came out. I probably would have had an even better time if I'd rewatched these episodes at a leisurely pace, on the sofa with some hot chocolate, some mince pies over the course of a week or so, rather than binging it at my desk on a rainy November afternoon. But Sailor YouTube V, I guess. And the questions that we've been pondering for the last half an hour? How many storylines you can cram into six episodes? The function of the TV format? The success and potential of low-stakes storytelling? These questions largely remain after you finish watching Hawkeye, and maybe we're not much closer to answering them, even after this mammoth of a retrospective. But is that a bad thing, really? Maybe Hawkeye's not trying to answer them. Maybe it couldn't care less about them, because it's too busy having a good time hitting trick shots and feeding dogs pizza. I could tell this show it's got a fatal flaw, that it's overstuffed, that it's narrowly held back from greatness, and it wouldn't give a damn. To be honest, I respect that. At the end of the day, none of these flaws stop Hawkeye from being fun, from being a good time, from making some interesting points. And if saying that makes me a shill, then maybe I'm just a shill. Yep, can't think of a better note to end on than that, so thanks for watching. Special shout out as always to my Patreon supporters on screen now, especially Strange Folk and Tig. And if anyone watching this wants to help me try and make ends meet while receiving a bunch of awesome benefits, consider joining up yourself from as little as two quid a month. Oh, and by the way, if the voiceovers sounded a bit odd in this video, I do apologize. I think I'm coming down with something, and I do not feel great. But yeah, farewell. I wish you all a very merry like and subscribe-mas. Thank you.